Welcome to the uh, weekly research seminar. I'm Rod Ewing, the other co-director at uh, CSAC. And today it's my pleasure to introduce one of our own, Paul Edward. Uh, Paul is the William Perry Fellow in International Security in CSAC. Uh, he's also the director of the Science, Technology and Society um, unit in H&S. Uh, he's written a number of different books, but most notable, I would say, is uh, a, vast, a Vast Machine, Computer Models, Climate Data, and the Politics of Global Warming. Uh, what um, he'll be speaking about today grows out of the fact that uh, Paul was one of the lead authors on the uh, sixth assessment report of the IPCC uh, report, which was released just August 9th. Okay, just some months uh, uh, ago. And he'll be uh, describing the inner workings of the process as well as the policy implications of the result. Okay. Thank you, Rod. Can people hear me in the back? Yes? Okay, great. Well, I have much more to share with you than I probably have time for. I'll try to get through this in about half an hour and leave plenty of time for uh, Q&A. You can ask me more about the process during that time. This is, so I'm, I'm gonna report on what I've, basically everything I've been doing for the last three years. It's an incredibly involved and time consuming process, these assessment reports. So I'm gonna invite you to look at this slide. I show this often. You know, as the history of industrialization in the in the uh, in the world. So now we're up in the 1940s, and you know where this goes. In some ways, what we can say about the sixth assessment report so far is that it tells us that we know what we already knew, only better. So things are not looking good. The last decade was the warmest on record. Last year was the warmest on record. And this past July was the warmest July on record. So what is the IPCC? I, mean, I find that this is surprisingly not as well known as I wish it were. It's been around since 1988. It issued its first report in 1990. It is an expert assessment of the state of the art of climate science. That's to say it is not a science laboratory. It does not have its own models. It does not have its own researchers, no facilities of any kind for research. It relies primarily on previously published peer reviewed literature. Each time the IPCC goes through an assessment cycle, some of the members change out. So it's not even the same organization in some sense from report to report. So this is the sixth assessment cycle. There've already been several reports in the cycle before this one. And the part that I am working on, have worked on, is this one. I mean, these are the, the fifth assessment because the second and third working groups have not reported yet. So this report that I'm gonna talk about is about the physical science of climate change. The other two reports are more policy focused. They are about impacts on people and ecosystems adaptation to climate change, vulnerability to climate change, and how we can mitigate it. So those are coming out soon. Well, I think we, we'll get working group two maybe in December, and then working group, group three a few months after that. So let me just, uh, you know, I, I got into this business as a historian of science and technology, but I've been studying it for so long that I've sort of become a climate scientist by default. Let me just run through a few things from the history of climate science partly to emphasize just how old and well-developed our knowledge of this field is. So the greenhouse analogy comes from Joseph Fourier in 1822, who understood that the atmosphere retains heat. Eunice Foote in 1856, the first person to suggest that carbon dioxide would, if it were increased in concentration, would warm the planet. Arrhenius, Svante Arrhenius, a Swede in 1896, modeled the uh, warming produced by carbon dioxide, both on you know, getting higher, but also getting lower. He was principally in interested in ice ages. In 1938, 
Uh, Guy Callender did some measurements of CO2 and temperature and concluded that there had already been about a four-tenths of a degree centigrade increase in temperature. In 1979, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report that essentially established the consensus on exactly how much the planet would warm if carbon dioxide doubled, and that number has stayed more or less stable ever since. It's about three degrees centigrade. And finally, the first IPCC report in 1990. So this is number six. So I'm gonna talk a lot from the FAQs for this report because I think they're clearer and actually better graphics than a lot of the body of the report itself. It's huge, it's uh, about 2000 pages long. So the FAQs are a good place to get a grip on things if you don't have a, a, a lot of deep science interest. So we've gone from a phase in 1990 where people thought it was probably going, carbon dioxide was probably going to cause global warming, but they weren't sure because they couldn't separate the signal from the noise yet, to a point in 2021 where we simply call it an established fact. I mean, nothing in science is ever 100% certain, but we're at about the 99.5% level now. So that's, uh, it's rare for scientists to say a thing like that. That's what we said. Two important things happened during this report cycle. One was that the energy budget was closed. That means that we, you know, we know how much energy is coming in from the sun. We know how much is being re-radiated into space. Those have to balance, but some heat is retained or else our temperature would be zero in the dark, absolute zero. Um, so how much is being retained and where is it being retained? So now we know where all that energy is going and where it's being held in the earth. And the same thing with the sea level budget, the contributions from ice, land ice, sea ice, uh, uh, snow melt, all, all the, uh, and the thermospheric expansion of the water are all contributing to that. The other thing you can see from this slide is that we have much, much more data now than we did in 1990. So, Everything here, we've gone much, much further back in time, 65 million years of temperature, 450 million years of carbon dioxide, global ocean heat content, very difficult to measure now, pretty well measured back to 1871. So here's what I mean about heat retention. In a climate that is at equilibrium, there's a balance between the incoming solar energy and the outgoing energy. Here on the right, we have what the situation today, which is that same amount of solar energy is coming in, but some of it is being retained, most of it in the ocean. Water is much denser than air and there's a lot of it, so it holds much more heat than anything else. Some on the land and the atmosphere, actually only 1% of the heat that is retained. We care about that because we live in the atmosphere but if you're thinking about it physically, the ocean is far, far more important. What do we know about the distant past? Well, we look here at two situations. One, uh, the, the Pliocene era, three million years ago, when carbon dioxide concentrations were about what they are today, but the temperature was between two and a half to four degrees warmer than today. The sea level was between five and 25 meters higher. So this isn't a climate that has had time to adjust. It, it is at equilibrium. Then during the last interglacial, 125,000 years ago, carbon dioxide concentration was lower. Uh, temperatures still sometimes were a little bit higher than today. Uh, and sea level was also higher than today. So right now we are not at equilibrium. We have been adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, most of them since about 1980. So you see there uh, the 19th century averages and the current state of things. And then finally on the far right, two scenarios, a high and a low for where we may go in the next century or the next 80 years really. So still adjusting. And some of these things are locked in, especially sea level rise. If we take that out to 2300 or 2500, we see that we're gonna get five meters of sea level rise by then, no matter what happens. Another thing that we did in this report was to look back at past climate modeling exercises to see how well they did. 
And the way this has typically been done in the past is to look at the temperatures that they projected in the future. But to project a temperature, they had to guess how much emission there would be in between. And of course, they didn't know, so they made several scenarios. Now we've, what we've done here is basically rerun these models with uh, the emissions that actually happened. So instead of time, down here what you see is radiative forcing the, the, by greenhouse gases. So that's what's happened over time. And we see that the, the, we capture the black line, the observations really quite well, even with models going back as far as 1970. Suki Manabe, who won the Nobel Prize a few days ago. With, along with another climate modeler. And I just put this up here because I had the pleasure of doing an oral history of Suki Manabe back in 1998. I spent 12 hours with him sitting in his kitchen, learning about his life and all his work. Wonderful, wonderful guy. So what else did we learn? We learned that climate models are improving. The current round of model intercomparison projects is CMIP-6. We do this every time for IPCC reports, compare all the models with each other, run some uh, basic experiments with all the models using the same data sets. So we're comparing apples to apples. So CMIP-6, we see that the skill at reproducing temperature is extremely good. The skill at reproducing precipitation is not so good, but it's better than it has been. Uh, and the model spread between CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 here is less. So getting, getting better. But one of the other key features of this report is that for some of the most important numbers like equilibrium climate sensitivity, we did not rely on models. That's the first time that's happened. So we've been able to do it from process understanding and observations and paleoclimate information. So if we look back at the last 2,000 years, we can see that the warming we've got now has much warmer than it's been in the last 2,000 years. We also see on the right that if we take, if, if we try to simulate with models what would have happened without the human presence, without deforestation and greenhouse gases and all of that, that's the lower line there. So if we only had solar and volcanic forcings None of the models can reproduce what actually happened in the last few decades. So now we get into looking at the future. And here, you know, we don't know where the Earth will go in terms of emissions. That depends on us and on our policies, which I will talk about in a little bit. But we still barely have a chance to hold warming to about one and a half degrees centigrade warming in the Arctic, you also see major increases in precipitation in those dark green zones there uh, near in the western, uh, sorry, the eastern Pacific and in the Sahara Desert. If we get to three degrees, which I personally think is quite likely by the end of the century, much more warming, also more precipitation, but there we begin to see drought bands. And that's important. So these are the places where drought is likely to increase as the century goes on. And one of the things you can see that's actually already happening is that Central America is getting drier. And about 30% of the migrants that come into the United States from Central America say that they're coming here because they can't grow their staple food crops, corn and beans anymore in the climate that they have. Another thing that could happen is the Gulf Stream could shut down. That's, in this report, what we say is that's not likely to happen, but it is likely to weaken. And there is already evidence that it has weakened somewhat. So the Gulf Stream is what keeps Northern Europe warm because it carries heat from the tropical area of the, of the Atlantic up into the North Atlantic. And as the wind blows from west to east across the Gulf Stream, it picks up heat and maintains the, the temperature of uh, most of Europe at a relatively high level compared to similar latitudes in the United States and Canada. So if that sinks, 
Paradoxically, Europe is likely to get colder than it is today. One question people ask me a lot is what about permafrost? Because this has come up a lot. There's our frozen tundra. It contains vast amounts of organic matter in various states. Um, it, if it were to melt, it would decay and release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. The sense right now from in this report is that that is likely to happen. There will be some melting of permafrost, but it is not enough to cause a kind of tipping point runaway warming, at least not yet. Another advance since the last report is event attribution. So this means taking an individual weather event like a storm, a flood, a hurricane, and uh, or a drought and comparing how likely it would have been in an earlier world using a model versus uh, how likely it is today. And so then we can say, you know, this, this event might have happened anyway, but it was 30% more likely now. And we're seeing this play out, for example, in Texas, which had three 100-year events in a five-year period in the 2010s. Okay, let me talk some about the assessment process. So this began for me in July, 2018 and just finished in August, 2021. And actually what I'm doing right now is even part of the cycle because I am supposed to tell everybody I can about the results of this report. And that's why I'm talking to you. So this, you know, these are massive things. We, there are 14,000 scientific articles uh, cited in this report. Most of these were previously published and peer reviewed. There's sometimes gray literature that has not been peer reviewed, but is public, um, that is considered. The way the process works is like this. So we meet in, met in July, 2018, and I thought, okay, there'll be a nice long spin up period here and uh, we'll have six months or something to write. Uh, the first draft of this report. No, I had to write the first draft in August of 2018. So we all just went to work like beavers and wrote this internal draft, which is then reviewed by everybody else in the working group. So internal review. The next round is the first order draft. So we, you know, we deal with all those comments, we expand the draft, we make it much more uh, detailed and begin to fill in blanks there we don't have information for yet. And that at that point, it's opened up for expert review. Now, in the case of the IPCC, you can self-declare your expertise. So essentially anyone can sign up to be a, a reviewer of the IPCC. Uh, we had one particular individual known mainly to us as retired, since that's how he listed himself, who wrote hundreds of comments on the report, almost none of them having any, any substance. On the other hand, most people were very serious about this and the comments are long. You'd often get you know, two or three paragraphs with many papers cited that we would then need to read and review and incorporate into the report. And the requirement of the IPCC is that we have to respond to every single comment. So none of us, except the people who had been through this before, really understood what that was gonna mean in terms of time because I, I would say that the balance between writing the report and adjusting it using the, you know, going through the comments was maybe 25% writing and the rest responding to review. So then we get the second order draft and that's reviewed by internally by us and then by outside experts and then also by governments, which are technically members of the IPCC they cannot participate in drafting the report or changing anything, but they can comment. And some government representatives really know quite a bit about climate science, so that's, they're really worth listening to. Then we revise again, there's another round of internal review, and finally it goes out as the final government draft. And the last stage, very last stage, is when the summary for policymakers, just like 30 pages, is approved by the government representatives at one massive meeting line by line. The only thing the governments can say at that point is, we don't think that this summary line actually reflects what you said in the body of the report. 
that's kind of the limit of what they can do, but that's still sometimes enough to change the tone of a of a of a important sentence. So one thing that IPCC has really tried hard to do is to uh, expand its membership to as many countries as possible so that everyone has an investment in the process uh, to increase the numbers of women and people of color. I'd point to, you know, 30% of members when I was on this uh, report were new to the IPCC for the first time, and that's kind of typical. So there's a lot of cycling of scientists through, so it's not always the same people with a, a rigidified point of view. And so you see, we got 78,000 review comments, and we responded to all of them, and it was exhausting, believe me. Now, the, one of the things the IPCC was accused of early on was not being transparent about how it does its reports. So the practice for the last three cycles has been to publish the draft and the comments and the responses. They're all de-identified, so you don't know who said what, but you, know, you can see all, the, all these things. You can download them. This is the fifth assessment report here. But you know, with numbers of comments like that, we're talking about the most intensive peer review process in the history of science by a long shot. Okay. I could talk about this for a long time, but I'm going to try to keep focused on what the reports say and how that translates into policy importance. So the one and a half degree report, which came out in 2018, it's part of this sixth assessment cycle. The Paris Agreement directed the IPCC to report on what it would take to keep global temperature increase to one and a half degrees. So they dutifully did that. And then to do it, they invented scenarios that would lead to that result. And one thing you see here, so we're talking about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions going to zero by about 2060, and then going below zero. So this is the idea of negative emissions that would happen if there were massive reforestation or if there were some technology that could remove carbon directly from the air or something else like that. Um, many people I know, and I think I'm in this camp myself, regard this as a fantasy. This will not happen, at least not in this century. We do not have that technology. We don't have the land to reforest on that scale. This is very unlikely to occur. So the Paris Agreement happened in 2015. It was ratified. Last year, nations commit, made new commitments to the treaty to uh, ramp up their mitigation. In 2023, there will be a global stock take where we'll do a kind of analysis of how much is being emitted. You know, are countries really meeting their commitments? Uh, are they able and willing to ramp up even further? And that's, that process is supposed to happen every five years, kind of cycling through a stock take, renewed commitment, and ratcheting up the level of commitment. But what we can see here is that the commitments that have been made so far if we're lucky, if they're actually implemented as planned, which is unlikely, we're still gonna end up at about three degrees centigrade. Now maybe we'll get more uh, commitments as time goes on, but that's where we stand today. That half a degree between one and a half and two degrees, which is the kind of top line Paris target, that's a big difference in human terms. And here are some of these things. So going from about 14% of the population exposed to severe heat to 37%, sea level rising a bit more, crop yields going down, uh, ecosystems much more exposed to damage. So every tenth of a degree will matter. Every ton of carbon dioxide and methane will matter too. So in the last report, the, the, the way they framed this was in terms of a carbon budget. This is how much we've already emitted. 2,560 billion tons of CO2 already emitted. 
if we want to stick to one and a half degrees, we've got about 400 uh, billion tons left. The rate of emission right now is about 40 billion tons a year. So that would be 10 years at the current rate and then hard stop. If we want to stick to two degrees, we have a little bit more leeway and it depends a bit on what we go after first because methane only lives for about 20 years in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide lives for 400 years. So if we go after methane, we can make a big dent in global warming very quickly. Unfortunately, methane is a component of natural gas and, or I should say fossil natural gas uh, and very, very popular now because it's cheap. So the sad history of this field is that every report indicating warming has been accompanied by an increase, not a decrease in global carbon dioxide emission all the way along. So what can you do with the materials in this report? And this is kind of where I wanted to get to for the people in this room specifically. We have a, a new feature here, which is an interactive atlas of climate change. You can look at this, you can look at any of the 45 inhabited regions that we project for and get a read on what's likely to happen in that place. Also on how likely it is. And you can look at different scenarios of, you know, for one and a half up to four degrees growth. So this is, here we're looking at heat and the dots indicate how confident we are in the result. So, most places in the world have already experienced increases in heat extremes. Now, what does that mean in human terms? Let me just put this up here. This is not from the IPCC report, a previous study though. So end of this century in India, uh, the, the, the Eastern part of the country becomes, reaches temperatures up to 35 degrees centigrade. That is a lethal level of heat. You can't sweat it off at that level. And many of the people who live there don't have access to air conditioning, maybe not even to shelter capable of defending them a little bit. They work outdoors as farmers. So when we're talking about that level of heat increase, we may see people simply abandoning that area, just too dangerous. In the Middle East, there are heat waves projected to go to 150 degrees Fahrenheit for weeks toward the end of the century. But even more important than heat really is water. So what happens to water? And climate change moves water around on the planet. For every degree centigrade in temperature increase, the air holds about 7% more water, which is part of why we're seeing these rain bomb events, you know, massive floods with just colossal quantities of rain coming down all at once. And that will get worse. Just looking at the United States, this is all kinds of weather related disasters. Uh, all glommed together, but part of what we see is that in the last couple of decades, we uh, there, the number of billion dollar events, and that's price adjusted, has been increasing. Now turning to drought, you know, this is us, Western North America, right here, right? And as we know, we're in a drought now. It resembles the mega drought that wiped out the Anasazi in the uh, 13th century. And it may last that long, decades. So what does that mean? Well, here is the, from the National Climate Assessment, again, modeling the frequency and intensity of, of forest fires, cumulative area burned, without climate change and with climate change. And a final tool that I would point you to if you're interested in a particular area is this sea level projection tool, which is, not, which is a sort of collaboration between NASA and the IPCC. If you just look up that phrase, you'll find it immediately. And with this, you can uh, 
you can you can pick many options. You know what you want to look at, when, uh, and which scenario of climate change you want to you want to see. So all those little dots are places it will give you a projection for. Interesting thing, because sea level doesn't rise in a uniform way. It's different in different places, and Asia is about going to be hit harder than North America. But again, in human terms, what does this mean? Well, there's the city of Shanghai with 3 million people at 3 degrees centigrade coming into equilibrium, sea level rising. Alexandria in Egypt, mostly underwater, and so on. So what can we do about this? Well, there, you know, there are a million things on the table and I'm happy to talk about any of them that you wanna talk about, but to me, one of the most interesting studies so far is this modeling exercise called Drawdown. I think this is a 2018 or 2019 book by Paul Hawken and his uh, group. So they're sort of doing out of the box thinking, what can contribute to, result, to mitigating climate change that is not necessarily just reducing emissions? So they find that things like plant-rich diet, you probably knew that, uh, refrigerant management, number one, that's because hydrofluorocarbons and to some extent chlorofluorocarbons are still being produced and they're super potent greenhouse gases. So there have been a, a whole set of steps in the Montreal Protocol to reduce the amounts of those that we produce and that's worked quite well, but it can go even further. Educating girls, family planning, these two things alone. You know, uh, women who are, who are better educated tend to have smaller families. They tend to be more independent, able to work for themselves. Uh, and then of course, you know, things like solar farms, but this one is also interesting. Jennifer Granholm has been talking about this recently, rooftop solar can make a really important contribution. We've got all this surface area on the roofs of buildings and you know, parking garages, houses, everything else that could be turned into uh, uh, solar panels without using up new land. So one of the big problems with the solar farms is they take you know, gigantic areas of desert or you know, someplace that people might live or creatures might live. We've already got plenty of surface area. You just need to use it. So can we do something about this? I think we can, I think we must. And we have evidence that sometimes people can pull together and do amazing things. We ended African slavery, at least in its legalized form. We eradicated smallpox, dismantled 80% of all nuclear weapons and saved the ozone layer. So I'm gonna stop there and open it up to you. What you got? First, uh, we'll follow our tradition of allowing uh, our fellows the first uh, set of questions. I must say, as I sat here and looked at you all masked, uh, I don't get your names correct <laughs> or at all, uh, don't be surprised. Um, all right, questions from fellows. Please. And identify yourself, please. Um, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I'm an Stanton fellow here great talk and I really like all the information that you presented. My fear though, and thus my question is how do you translate all this information to the public? Especially when you have all of these different problems making people understand science that we have seen with COVID. So it's, it's great that you have all this information out, but how do you make people understand it? So how do you, I'm on, thanks Luisa. Uh, difficult problem, not necessarily the most important problem because it doesn't, 
people don't need to understand all the detail to get the basic point, for one thing. The other thing is that the people who really need to do the work are the policymakers. So if you can get them to understand the point, you can make progress even if you've got a lot of opposition. That's kind of where we are now. I mean, we have a Americans uh, over the last 10 years have come around to supporting climate action strongly, uh, large majorities. There are still some deniers and kind of people who are uh, not so sure, but the majority does support that kind of action. And this is also true in Europe. And I believe that it's actually true in China too, which is maybe the most important place for it to be true. Um, hi, my name is Sana Vashira. Um, I'm also a Stanton postdoctoral fellow here. Um, and so my question is like from the inside from working on this report, how did you perceive the perception of the report among policymakers um, and particularly to shift off language within the report? Um, and then more broadly, um, I really like the list that you showed at the end from uh, Paul Hawken. But I wonder though, I mean, there is the financial data of it, but is the financial data in and of itself um, convincing to have people implement these measures? Um, and more broadly, like how do we overcome the carbon lock-in that is so prevalent within our society? Thank you. I, you know, these are all really tough questions, but uh, in terms of reactions of policymakers, that I think is kind of still working its way through. I don't have any special inside knowledge about that. I don't think that we that we said anything that they didn't already know in a lot of ways. So in in a way, it's you know it's it adds detail, it adds strength to the conclusions, but it doesn't necessarily change what they think they should be doing. Um, what was your second question? It was about. Yeah, well, th that's the big one. Th that's the hardest thing of all. So, you know, carbon lock-in, I mean, if we just take the transportation sector, which is the largest single source of uh, emissions in the United States, uh, you know, we have 280 million cars here, and only about 1% of them are electric now. Uh, we need to electrify them all, but we also need to get that electricity from renewable sources, and that's a very tall order. I wrote a little piece in the conversation about that um, right after the report came out, because then you start to think about all the other things that have to be electrified. So San Francisco, where I live, is about to um, is working on an ordinance that would try to convert every house from gas, heat, and water heating to electric. That's a huge order because these are old buildings, a lot of them. You know, so very expensive to do it. And you know, who would pay for it? You can't really lay it on a homeowner, but maybe the city can help. And so it's, you know, th these are these are terribly difficult problems. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Ryan Musto. I'm a nuclear security postdoctoral fellow here at CSAC. Um, so in in August, I noticed that Fox News had published an article on the IPCC report. And I noticed it because my sister wrote it. And she wrote it and she quoted a fellow at the Hoover Institution extensively who kind of cast doubt on the conclusions. He says that it overstates the effects of climate change, that it misses adaptation that occurs, um, and that there's even some important kind of net positives, such as global greening. So in order for me to have some fodder going forward at you know the Thanksgiving dinner table, I was wondering if you could respond to such, such notions um, by someone who's here at Stanford. Should I send you some slides that you can show? I would really appreciate that. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, we, you know, we get a lot of things like that. We get, you know, one of them is that uh, it's gotten warmer and so fewer people are dying from cold. They're not freezing to death, you know, and sure, true. On the other hand, one of the things we know about heat 
from people uh, who work here, Marshall Burke and, and David LaBelle and others, is that heat and death are correlated. So death from all causes, accidents, murders, suicides, uh, they all go up when the temperatures get high. So the, the hotter it gets, more people will die from, from that cause. And then, you know, as I was saying, there are going to be heat waves in some parts of the world that may make it really, truly uninhabitable. And uh, that, if that's an acceptable outcome, maybe to, <laughs> I don't know where your Hoover guy wants to live, but uh, he's got to find someplace. Um, you know, the pushback against the IPCC has been going on since it began. I, you know, I wrote an article uh, soon after the report was done about the peer review process in IPCC and talked about a couple of episodes as early as 1995 where they were just kind of savagely attacked for basically for changing a couple of words in, in a report from, for saying the, the balance of evidence now suggests that human causes are the a reason for global warming. So, you know, these attacks are not new. Uh, they're mostly from people who don't understand the science and haven't participated in the scientific process. You know, I've just showed you that anyone who wants to can throw their their opinions in there, and if they can back them with evidence, uh, that organization considers that evidence and takes it into account. Sometimes what happens if you have an outlier result that might be the kind of thing your Hoover guy would would appeal to, sometimes that becomes the tail of a distribution. But it would be in there if there's evidence for it. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, Paul. My name is Sugiya Park. Um, I have two questions, and please pardon me if you said it and I missed it. Uh, the first question is, does IPCC have any recommendations on how we should address the uneven distributions of the global climate change effects? And my second question is, how do you become an author of the IPCC? And I think at the beginning slides, you showed us um, many authors from 65 countries, the percentage of women versus men. But do these 65 countries represent the globe equally? Well, yeah, great question. So broadly about you know uh, equity in the in the science and in the outcomes well one of the sadder things that we know is that the, the tropics are the place where uh, and, and the subtropics are the places where global warming has been steadily creeping up those latitudes tend to have less variable climates so the signal emerges earlier there than it does in the mid latitudes where where we are now, where it's highly variable. So that's part of why people who live in these latitudes can poo poo global warming because they don't see the signal as as directly as people at the low latitudes and in the Arctic. So uh, every uh, element of the negotiations around the the framework convention on climate change includes a lot of jockeying for position from smaller states from states with really unique stakes in the outcomes like Bangladesh or the uh, small island states that are very low lying and really threatened by sea level rise. I mean, existentially threatened by sea level rise. So, uh, I mean, I was at the 2015 Paris COP that, that, where the negotiation was made and, uh, and witnessed, you know, people practically screaming during during the negotiation session. I mean, not outside in the hall, which had, where it happens all the time, but you know, during the negotiation session, saying we we can't go to two degrees. We will be wiped out if we get to two degrees. So that they pushed that one and a half degree goal in there, even though it's you know what what I just showed you is it's probably unreachable. So. The organization has worked pretty hard to uh, recruit scientists from lots of countries, but not every country has much of a science establishment. So in my part of the report, the, the physical science part, there's sort of an inherently limited uh, pool. The other two are a bit different. Uh, you know, there's more concern and more uh, study of outcomes in parts of the developing world, and therefore there will be more authors from other countries in those sessions. But there was just a report yesterday or two days ago that the uh, 
So, you know, the United States, Europe, Japan, the wealthy countries are studied, you know, the outcomes for them are studied much more heavily than the outcomes for the rest of the world. So, you know, it's a, it's a spin up issue for those countries. And it's also an issue for the whole scientific community to focus on every place and not just on uh, the places that the scientists are from. Thank you, Paul. I was really glad to see you listed. We dismantled 80% of all nuclear weapons on your chart up there. Thank you for that. But my question actually follows well on Slogis. Um, I'm interested in why you aren't seeing equal effects in the Southern Hemisphere. Why isn't Antarctica being affected as much? We worry about giant elf sh uh, shelf uh, ice, uh, you know, cracking off of Antarctica, but it's not the same degree. And it seems that the scientific evidence is backing that up that we can't expect the same dire effects down south. So why is that? Uh, it's, it's mainly because the Southern Hemisphere is mostly ocean. So the climate is more uh, stable in, in the Southern Hemisphere because the, the ocean governs the, the atmosphere. In the Northern Hemisphere, you get much higher variations of air temperature because of the, the, there's so much land mass. Um, it's also because of what happens to the sea ice in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, most of the, you see these pictures of the North Pole, but of course the North Pole is actually underwater. There's no, uh, there's no land there. And most, when you see the ice cap, you're seeing sea ice, which is breaking up and melting now, getting very much thinner. And we're likely to see uh, ice-free Arctic oceans sometime in the next 20 years, at least once in the summer. So, you know, they, they just have very different climate profiles, the way, the, way the, the system works in those two places. Right. Uh, I'll switch over. I want to uh, provide uh, some of the questions came in from the framed version. Uh, this is from Paige Fortna at MIT. Can you talk more about the implications for international security, human security implications in the sphere? What about traditional security concerns? I picked this question because I want to add just a bit to it. Um, of course, many in the nuclear community see their role as large moving forward, but with expanded nuclear, there are nuclear security concerns. So if you could speak to uh, Paige's general question and maybe one. Yeah, so on international security in the more traditional sense, well, I mean, it affects uh, navies especially. I mean, the, the, the U.S. Navy is, has been planning for decades at this point to, to deal with sea level rise and what it will mean for its naval bases. Uh, you know, that's not, not about conflict, but just about adjusting, and it's expensive. You know, so the, there's a budget issue there. Um, there are, and conceivably, uh, other kinds of things, such as, and we've already seen this, uh, if air temperatures get high enough, the asphalt on runways can become too uh, viscous to fly airplanes to land. So, you know, there too, another issue for a military force. Uh, as for conflict, you know, it, it's a difficult issue because there's, Military conflict doesn't ever happen all by itself, you know, for just one reason. There, and climate change has certainly played a part in the Syrian civil war, but exactly what part is hard to know. I mean, th before the, Syri the civil war began, there was a drought in that region that lasted five years, and uh, many places ran out of, in rural areas, ran out of water completely. So those people had to move just to get water, and they went to the cities. So influx of people from rural areas into the cities, more tension, more people interacting, maybe ideologies, lots and lots of other things happening at the same time, and civil war. So it's 
we're, we're unlikely to see really direct lines between climate change and conflict, but any place where there is a water sharing issue is a candidate for that, and that's you know many states all over the world. Nuclear, yeah, a couple things. Well, one is that you know, so nuclear is a low carbon form of energy. It can it it could have utility in getting us past the, uh, you know, giving us a way to produce electricity without releasing a lot of carbon. But at the same time, the history of it, you know, as you know, is that nuclear power plants have gotten more and more expensive and taken longer and longer to build over time. So being able to do it quickly is seeming to be very unlikely. Uh, the, another issue is that nuclear power plants need cooling water, and so a lot of them are located on rivers or on the ocean where they can draw cooling water from those sources. And you know, in the uh, 2003 heat wave in France, the water in the in the river uh, in in the Rhone got so warm that the nuclear power plants had to reduce their production because the, the water was not war was not cool enough to keep them cool. And that meant that exactly the wrong time when they most needed the electricity for air conditioning, they had less electricity to provide. There are some complicated issues there too. Thanks, uh, this is Gaurav Pawar. I'm a visiting scholar here at CSAC. So uh, my question is, so in like your last slide, you show what we can do, right? And you show some projection for next 100 years. Uh, so what I believe, like all uh, climate change issue, they start from individual level, right? So uh, we talk about here, like maybe national level issues, what we can do. So is there any component on individual level issues that we need to address? What level I'm missing a word. Yeah. So is there any like individual things that we can do? Individual things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so thing one I would say about that is that this is an infrastructure problem. Individuals bear some responsibility, but you're, it's very unlikely that you can cut your own carbon footprint by more than 20 or 30 percent by doing anything. That said, you should still try, <laughs> you know, so electric cars, public transportation, biking and walking lifestyles, wearing climate appropriate clothing so you can keep the temperatures in buildings lower or higher and use less uh, heating. Uh, the, often the, the big choices are the ones that matter the most. So, you know, what kind of car you buy, where you buy, where you live relative to where you work, you know, are you on a train line or can you take a bike or something like that? Uh, putting solar panels on your house, you know, big investment up front, but it pays itself back. Insulating buildings is one of the biggest, you know, it's just, uh, there's so much that could be done by simply insulating the buildings we have, especially the older ones. It's not sexy, it's cheap, so it doesn't, politicians don't care about it, and yet it's one of the most cost-effective and powerful energy saving investments that you could make. Hi, uh, thank you for that amazing talk. Uh, my question was how much engagement during this process of the report or afterwards is there with people from academics from other disciplines? Maggie's Kafka economics. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back to William Nordhaus, 2018, winning the Nobel Prize for saying that climate change will only cause a few percentage point reduction in GDP, for example, right? So how do you deal with changing narratives in other professions, which might actually influence policy a lot more? And a sub-question of that is, like, have you, like, during the ICC, IPCC report, seen how economic growth and energy consumption are tied together and you know, how we can decouple that relationship, what scope of decoupling do we need, and what that means for economic growth going forward. Thank you. Okay, I'll, let me go with the last question first. So the best estimate I have seen is that we would need to decouple at the rate of about 7% a year to achieve the Paris goals. 
No nation has ever done that. Uh, the, the greatest level of decoupling that's, that's been achieved so far is about three and a half percent. Doesn't mean it can't be done, it just means it hasn't been done yet. So, um, you know, the, I think there is a real question about whether global capitalism in the form we have it now is compatible with protecting the climate. Um, in terms of other disciplines, well, so the, you know, the, the report that I worked on is mainly physical scientists, naturally, because it's about the physical science of climate change. I am a, you know, I'm a historian of science and technology, but I've spent so much time working with climate scientists over 30 years that they just kind of accepted me as one of their own. And I know enough about it to make the right kinds of contributions. I don't, you know, try not to go out on a limb. Um, the second and third working groups have a lot of economists and other social scientists in them. And in fact, you know, one of the critiques of those groups is they have too many economists because economists tend to come from, you know, a sort of background assumption that the way we're doing things now is a good way and we need to try to preserve it. That may not be possible. So uh, stretching beyond that perspective to look at other uh, potential economic systems and you know, how, we would, how we're going to support 10 billion people uh, without everyone reaching a standard of living like the, the one that Americans or Europeans have. Just at the end, but uh, I have a question from um, outside of this room uh, that we'll end on. So just a very short answer. This is from Joyce, Joyce Lynn. Uh, are there any topics that you thought the IPCC report should have covered but did not? Sure. Well, we did get, so, so there are two pieces in chapter one, which is the chapter team I was on. Uh, there are two parts of chapter one. One is about the political and social context of the report. And there we, get, we had a lot of pressure from some people to say more about the relationship between oil companies and denialism. And you know, we would never have written it in that language, but that's basically what it was. And I, I do think it, you know, we, there are a couple of sentences in there that sort of say political polarization studies show that there is a strong relationship between lobbying groups and uh, the, the, the climate policies of particular countries and public opinion. But there's not much more than that. And the reason for that is that the IPCC is supposed to be policy neutral. That is, we don't, you know, we don't set policy. We look at lots of different possibilities and present them all and policymakers decide what to do. All right, with that, we've come to the end of the hour. So let's all thank uh, Paul for an excellent presentation. <laughs>